All right, let me share the screen. I want to first thank everybody for uh, taking the time out of their busy schedules to listen uh, to the lecture and also to just uh, participating in this 17-day conference. Um, for those who you don't know, my name is Dr. Sunil Pai, and I am back for the third time. Thank you very much for Stephen for inviting me and everybody, Ben, and everybody here at The Real Truth About Health, allowing me to provide you the best information possible. Um, today, I'm going to do something quite different. Um, some of it's going to be similar, you know, because I want to give some just general definitions of inflammation, but I want to talk about stacking. Um, most of these things are covered in my book in further, further detail, but every time I'm doing a lecture now, I'm kind of taking a little aspect and going a little bit deeper um, so that we can have more and more information. I will recommend all of you to go back to the last two years uh, of my lectures on this platform, The Real Truth About Health, and also go to my website. Uh, there's a media section uh, on sendgevity.net, and you can look at all the other videos and interviews and lectures that I've given at other conferences as well. The more information that you get, we're evidence-based. So what that means is that we're using anything that's scientifically proven or, or shown uh, in the clinical literature worldwide. And that's what we want to improve every day is your outcome uh, rather than saying it's, you know, conventional or alternative being integrative. We're looking at the patient's improved outcome by any means necessary, looking at potency, purity, safety, and efficacy of what we do. Today, I'm going to talk about the stacking effects of inflammation and basically how to avoid it and reduce it naturally. So first, I want to talk about just, again, giving you uh, a general um, idea and definition of what inflammation is. Inflammation is now what we consider, and this is something that I've been working on for the last 20 years, and particularly when I wrote my book, after many, many years of uh, practice, 22 years of seeing you know, thousands of patients with these chronic inflammatory diseases, is looking at what is that underlying triggering mechanism, and can we get it at the root cause? Can we stop the progression of disease? And now we look at, we can. Um, and in my book, I have 10 steps, and it's about epigenetics, your diet, your lifestyle, the change in the environment, and also the improvement of your belief system. You know, your body has an innate ability to heal. We just have to give it all the tools that it needs to do so. So inflammation is the triggering mechanism here of all diseases. And in fact, you know, more recently in the last two years, and last year I gave a specific lecture just on COVID, uh, and the comorbidities of why we get actually more uh, problems here in the United States, having more comorbidities health conditions like heart disease, diabetes, obesity, and, and autoimmune conditions, where when the virus came, which is a pro-inflammatory uh, triggering mechanism that hits our body, it made us in the United States have more uh, fatalities, unfortunately. So right now you can see almost every single disease now has an inflammatory component. And, you know, I always describe it as the fire within the body. And um, the suffix itis, I-T-I-S, okay, um, that means inflammation. Um, and it's inflammation is derived from the word fire or phlegm. So when you see here on the upper left, um, you see this kitchen, you see this living room, and you see this bedroom, you know, we need a certain amount of inflammation. Inflammation is not always bad. Inflammation actually uh, triggers and, and controls hundreds and hundreds of biological mechanisms of keeping your body in balance, right? So you need to cook your food in your kitchen, you need to keep your house warm during the winter, and you need to say cozy in bed at nighttime. However, when it's uncontrolled here at the bottom and you see this aspect of the kitchen fire or the bedroom fire or the living room fire, that's too much. And that is what the itis, itis just means inflammation of whatever the word we put in front of it, it's inflammation of that area. So too much inflammation becomes a problem. Now we see that, hold on, I'm just going to do this here. We see that there's an, something called an acute versus chronic inflammation. So most of us are familiar with both. You know, we can have an allergic reaction, we can have an infection, we can actually get, like most of us will have some kind of injury. Maybe we sprained an ankle or we injured ourselves or maybe even cut ourselves, for example. That's an acute inflammatory response. Even fever is an acute inflammatory response, which in those cases are indicated. We want to have a fever because that's eliciting your immune system to upregulate and help fight and fix and repair whatever the problem is. The problem is when that, when that fever becomes chronic, or for example, in the beginning, when we have a wound, for example, you sprain your ankle, that ankle will swell. That swelling is an inflammatory response 
not only due to the trauma itself, but it's also the healing aspect. The body's saying, don't move your ankle now. Like it's going to make like a cast. It's going to be frozen almost. It's going to be stiff. It's going to be swollen because the body now needs to heal from the damage. So acute inflammation in general usually has an important role of telling us, hey, something is on. We need to pay attention. The problem is for most of us in the United States and around the world, we are moving into this chronic inflammatory state where we see chronic diseases from heart disease and you know neurological diseases, autoimmune cancers, and you name it. This is all this is this chronic inflammation, and we want to learn how to reduce that successfully. Now, chronic inflammation also leads to chronic diseases, as I just mentioned. So here's a picture of the knee on the upper left. I don't know if you can see my uh, cursor or not, so let me know, Ben, if they can see my cursor or Nancy. Um, but you have your healthy knee here, and then we have arthritis of the knee, right? So this inflammation of the joint causes the, this degeneration. If you look at the bottom left here, we have a healthy colon. And uh, just uh, the other day, I gave a, a a lecture on the microbiome. And we'll talk about that, where now we get inflammation, then you can get ulcerative colitis, colitis, right, of the colon, inflammation of the colon, Crohn's disease, you know, and different IBS type of symptoms. And then on the upper right here, you can see is the cardiovascular system. These are arteries of the heart. And you can see it's kind of clear right now, a normal cross section. And as someone eats more pro-inflammatory foods, more animal protein and saturated fats, which contain cholesterol and are pro-inflammatory, that leads to us having this heart disease problem where one in, you know, every minute, three people in the United States are having a heart attack. And it's still the number one cause of disease in the United States and worldwide is still heart disease. And when we look at neurodegenerative diseases like Alzheimer's now and Parkinson's disease, dementias, now we're looking at the brain being inflamed over decades due to a variety of things that I will speak in my book and I've spoken in my lectures and I'll also talk about today. So when the body gets hit, you know, whether it's the GI tract, whether it's your arteries, whether it's your brain, whether it's your joints, the chronic diseases make that part of the body more degenerative and worse. Furthermore, the chronic inflammation also makes us age. So we have these little telomeres. These are our end caps of our little, you know, our chromosomes. And with inflammation, it actually helps shorten them. And we're trying to extend these little uh, telomeres. And so the more inflammation that we have, the more oxidative stress that we get, and actually the shorter the lifespan. So the changing the diet and the lifestyle, the environment and belief system is important because we're trying to decrease the amount of inflammation in our body. Now we have over 200 different itis conditions. This is just a few, but remember anything with the itis afterwards. So if I, if I can start from the top of my head, you know, we can have like dermatitis, you can have conjunctivitis, red eyes, you can have runny nose, rhinitis, you can have sinusitis, you can have, you know, we had a, a wonderful doctor yesterday, dentist talking about gingival disease, you know, or periodontitis, right? Uh, you can get laryngitis, which I kind of have right now, a little bit of uh, a raspy throat. Uh, people can get a pharyngitis, you know, we can also get a thyroiditis, you know, we can get esophagitis, heartburn and reflux, we can get gastritis and colitis and vaginitis and prostatitis and, you know, arthritis. So as you know, almost all of us will have experienced some kind of inflammation, whether it's mild or, or, or moderate or severe in our lifetime. And the goal is to look at not just treat the skin with the topical ointment or the eye drops or the nasal sprays or the oral care or the inhaler for the bronchitis or, you know, the upper pill or the lower pill for the GI tract or the joint pill. What we're looking at is what are the underlying triggering mechanisms that make all of this itis and all this inflammation more abundant and damaging. So the worst thing about inflammation, and I think the previous lecture uh, spoke about this, and many of them have, will speak about this over this conference, is that also the increased risk of, of cancer is there over time. So I'll just give you an example, 43% of patients that have ulcerative colitis, inflammation of the colon, in about 30 years on average will develop colon cancer. You know, someone that has active rheumatoid arthritis, in the inflammation of their joints, which is very severe, over 10 years, if it's not well controlled, then they have a higher risk, 71 time higher risk of getting a lymphoma, which is a type of cancer. And most women will know about when they go get their uh, well at women's exam, and we're looking at doing the um, pap smears, we're looking for HPV. HPV is a little bit of a virus, but that virus that is chronically there over 10 to 20 years has a higher risk of turning into cervical cancer. So those are just a few examples and ideas. So the goals we want to re be reducing not only for the short term, but for the long term and also for the most severe conditions like cancer. Now, chronic disease and cancers are preventable in general, about 97%. 
So when we look at genes right here at the bottom right hand in the little green here, it's about two to three percent of disease is actually genetically related. And my book will cover this in detail because we always focus on genetics and genetics and genetics all the time with testing. People want to do all sorts of genetic testing all the time. They come to me and they're looking at all these kind of complicated genetic tests, but genes are just kind of what are in the cards, but it doesn't tell you how you're playing the game, right? There's something called epigenetics. Epigenetics is a diet, the lifestyle, the environment, and the belief system of how those genes actually express. So heart disease is something that people think they run in families or diabetes. Oh, my grandfather had diabetes. My dad had diabetes. My brothers have diabetes. But it's not a diabetic gene that's being really passed through. What it actually is, is the environmental epigenetics. It's the same diet that your grandparents ate that your parents ate, that teach you what to eat. And all of us right now have very similar epigenetics because our standard American diet and lifestyle now has been exported across the globe where people are pretty much eating everything the same. There's the uh, uh, golden arches and there's a, uh, you know, a coffee shop and there's, there's fast food restaurants everywhere. And now every country that is then overall changing those cultures epigenetics so that we all have the same conditions like heart disease and cancers and strokes and whatnot. And so when we look at what can we control, diet's the largest contributing factor for chronic disease and cancers. Obviously, tobacco, so people shouldn't be smoking or vaping. That's also covered in my book. And obesity is a large problem right now in America. And I did a lecture. You can see that on our website uh, on the media section. That's a specific thing that I want to talk about if people are interested in, like, they have a weight issue or they want to learn how to lose weight more effectively. I have many, many discussions on how to do that correctly and safely and effectively. Infections have to do with your immune system. And obviously, we'll talk a little bit today about the environmental uh, pollution and how we should be getting cleaner products in the environment. So again, let's focus on the 97% this that we actually can control and not be so stressed about, oh, I might have a gene that might turn on. Why don't we do what right now what we can do to actually take some strong action for change? Now, the places like inflammation likes to go is the following. There's four places that I talk about in my book. Um, so I'm just going to go about it real quickly here. You can hear about it in other lectures. I always make this analogy that your body's a flat roof. We have flat roofs in New Mexico. We have these wonderful kind of adobe style, you know, southwestern style homes. Unfortunately, they're flat roofs. They don't drain very well. So we always get roof leaks. Okay. It's not like here on the East Coast where they have like pitches and everything is draining nicely. Um, so there's four places that inflammation likes to go. Trauma is one of them. And that's what most people have. So think of your roof, you know, ha having a trauma. Say if a tree falls on the roof and it causes a little damage, when the tree is repaired, uh, when it rains again, if it keeps on raining, the weakest spot is still that place of that previous damage. So there's more likely to that itis to still remain or that will be the sensitivity area. So for example, you have a knee injury in college or a car accident hurt your back or you fell off a ladder during Christmas holidays with the Christmas lights. And that might have been 10 years ago, 20 years ago, maybe 50 years ago. But why is that back still hurting? It's because there's pro-inflammatory triggers coming into the diet and the lifestyle and the environment and your belief system that are making that worse. So it's kind of like the rain is now it's continuing going, even though the roof has been repaired, right? So there's no longer, I'm not falling off the, uh, the ladder anymore. I'm not, you know, I'm not playing football and getting injured. 20 years later, people will say, well, I have arthritis of my knee. And I am, well, I always ask them, what is the arthritis from? Aging. And I go, no, it's not aging. Aging is just more inflammation over time. You just have to find out what are those triggers. And we help all our patients who come see us find those triggers. Pathology means disease. And so anywhere, again, like once the tree has fallen there and it's actually broken and say there's a, there's a, there's a tile that's broken on your roof or a crack, then every time it rains, it's going to start to go there immediately. Overuse, we all understand overuse because we all, most of us in America have jobs that are repetitious. So, you know, we might work at a grocery store, we might work construction, we might work a job where we're physically doing manual labor. It's very, very hard on our feet and our back or say if you're, you know, all the, all the frontline workers who are working in the, in the food industries, you know, just trying to take and deliver groceries, for example, um, that chronic issue of repetitious motion can cause inflammation. Now, when we work out, that's a good thing. When we work out, we, you know, we get a little bit of soreness. But if you're eating a pro-inflammatory diet, then that inflammation for recovery takes a lot longer. So then what, what happens is when people are exercising, we're trying to reduce their infl inflammation, try to put them on an anti-inflammatory lifestyle, an anti-inflammatory diet, give them natural anti-inflammatories so they recover faster. So that's what we do when we work with professional athletes and, and other people, because we're looking at how do we make their body stronger and more built and have the stronger ability to continue doing what they're doing, even as time goes on, as we're aging. 
And lastly, uh, we want to strengthen the, my, our immune system. I won't talk about it much here, but in my book, we talk about the evidence-based natural things that you can take that have been clinically shown to increase natural killer cell function. We have a variety of products that we use that are patented that have clinical studies in vitro, in vivo, and in clinical human studies to show that. So when we have a cancer patient or we have some of the chronic inflammatory condition, we want to give them things that actually will help strengthen their immune system, not make it hyper, by the way, strengthen it so the body Body can help repair itself, fight and fix. And also vitamin D, super simple. I explained it a lot in my book. I explained it in my lectures. That's something that everybody should be taking on some level, should have your levels tested, and you should be between 60 and 100 on the test to get the optimum immune benefits from that. Now, there's these triggers of inflammation, smoking, solar radiation, alcohol, standard American diet, obesity, you know, all the, you know, the last two years now going forward still with the you know pandemic of of viruses then we also get bacteria we get parasites pollution and stress which all of us have undergone unfortunately a lot of stress going on these all contribute to inflammation i'm just going to talk about one of them today and a few, a few other aspects that i haven't talked about in my previous lectures we are an inflammation nation, just letting you know on all levels. And I always keep the slide up because, you know, when I wrote this book a few years ago, you know, we didn't realize the extent of inflammation. Now, physically, the environment is also having issues, as we know, with climate change. You know, spiritually, we can see that most of us are feeling a little stressed out. Uh, there's political divide. There's now countries at war, uh, economies that are, you know, on, on the brink of, of collapse. And so, you know, th this idea of this inflammation is now not just physical, spiritual, but it's also environmental and mental as well. So I like to use this example of when we talk about stacking effect is a levy. And I use this in my book. I use this all the time. I kind of use the um, levy point of Katrina because a lot of people remember like, oh, we heard the, the levees broke at Katrina when the, when the hurricane came and New Orleans was underwater. What I want to show is that over here is that this is normal inflammation. Every day, your body's going to have a certain amount of inflammation. It's going to go up and down, up and down. It's normal. Like we have normal wear and tear. At this top of this levy is your break point. Okay. So like, let's just say here's your digestion at the bottom here. It, the digestion's here. Then if you're having some inflammation, no problem. But then you're having more and more and more. You're getting my heartburn reflux. Once you tip that, now I have gastritis. Now I have really bad heartburn. I have IBS, irritable bowel, diarrhea, constipation, bloating, etc. Same thing. You know, you can have a skin issue. Okay, you have a normal wear and tear, and you cross your threshold. Now we have a rash. Same thing with your joints. Okay, there might be a little bit of achy, but when you cross that, now your joints are swelling and they hurt. And so it's it's this normal function of inflammation in our body that's the stacking effect. It's a little bit more. More, a little bit more of inflammation. And eventually, like here in the middle, you see that the, that, that the water here representing inflammation in this, in this example, it crosses that levy point. And there's no longer this like normal immune system that's protective. The physiology and biology is no longer protective. And then there's a spill. And this is when we start having a flare. So people can have like, you know, the water goes up, comes down, the, you know, the inflammation comes up, comes down. So we have a joint flare or a joint problem or a headache or a migraine or uh, colon cramps or something like that. And then eventually when that breaks, when there's this chronic inflammation, then, you know, it's called, we call it the breach. Then we have the systemic inflammation. New Orleans just was wiped out. So whether it's one centimeter over this levee or a foot, it still crosses that levy point, and then we, we we have this chronic disease. So today I'm going to talk about stacking effects. A lot of people, um, you know, especially in some of the, the discussion panels that we've had in the past and even last night, everybody's looking at one thing, like, oh, what is the one water? What is the one mat? What is the one pill? And it's not like that. It's never one thing. Disease is multifactorial, and that's where some people don't like what I say that, but it is. Disease is the perfect storm of this levy breaking and everybody wants to boil it down unfortunately to like well i didn't eat this or i didn't exercise enough or i didn't you know do enough meditation or i didn't do you know enough yoga it's a little bit of all of those things so in my book when i talk about the 10 definitive steps those are the things in the evidence-based medicine and science will show that if you do a little bit of all these 10, you don't have to be perfect in all of them. You just do a little bit of all of them, then you're reducing your overall risk. I'm a, I'm a realist. I'm not a perfectionist. So what we want to do with our patients is we want to always move them forward. And some things are easy to move. And some things are going to be a little bit more challenging depending on their diet or the lifestyle or, or their social environment or, and their community that they live in. So we always want to make sure that we're moving across these 10 steps a little bit at a time rather than just getting stuck on one and then not progressing further. Now, this slide here 
is a slide that, you know, I want you to go back after you listen to this lecture and just pause this screen. You can even print it out on your computer. This is the most important slide, because if you understand this slide, then really you don't have anything else to discuss with anybody talking about, well, are you eating correctly or not? If you understand what an uh, anti-inflammatory food is and a pro-inflammatory food, pro-inflammatory foods are animal proteins and saturated fats. Plant proteins are anti-inflammatory. We're not talking about food sensitivities. I'll talk about that in the next slide. But when we talk about inflammation is that, that animal protein is pro-inflammatory, it triggers inflammatory responses. I'll talk about that. A lot of doctors on the panel in this conference are going to talk about heart disease. Wonderful doctors are going to talk about how we can reverse heart disease, how we in our practice reverse heart disease all the time in our patients, right? Because animal proteins and saturated fats have cholesterol, oxidized cholesterol. And that's what sticks and causes the plaque in your arteries. Okay, remember, three people every minute. Number one cause of death right now, still across the board, regardless of what state you live in, regardless of what political divide you might have or belief system you have, or what zip code, or what, how much money you have in the bank, the number one cause of death is still cardiovascular disease, heart attack, and, str um, and strokes. So we want to make sure that we're, we're, we're reducing that. Now, a plant protein doesn't have that. So when people go on a plant-based diet within six months, we can start seeing reversal on angiogram of their cardiovascular health. Um, now, antioxidants are very low, little to none. Um, phytonutrients, there's no phytonutrients. And if you go back to my lecture yesterday or the other day on the microbiome, and even in the past, I go into that in very much detail. Uh, there's no fiber. There's no, uh, it causes dysbiosis and it has endotoxins. My, my lecture on the microbiome went specifically into this in detail. So please go back to that lecture because if you don't understand what dysbiosis means, if you don't understand what endotoxins means, if you don't understand the role of fiber, then we can help you with that. I'll, I'll briefly touch today if I can. And then all the pro-carcinogenic factors like insulin growth factor, NEU5GC and TMAO, heterocyclic amines. If you don't understand that, I will talk about that in the other lectures, but these are all pro-carcinogenic, pro-cancer causing molecules that come from animal proteins. So as you can see here, the opposite here is with plant proteins. That's why when people eat a plant-based diet, we can reverse 80, 80, 85% of disease just with diet alone. And then once we start looking at all the other epigenetic factors like the environment, and we're looking at natural anti-inflammatories and things that help stimulate the immune system and stress, et cetera, then we have a great success at improving people's health overall. Again, different things that trigger inf inflammation in the, from the animal protein and saturated fat is also triggering uh, diabetes and blood sugar problems, okay? And also the accumulation of just herbicides and pesticides and heavy metals, you know, even in the organic. And that's also been explained deeply in my book. It goes into much, much detail. So what you need to know at the end of the day that, that plant proteins and eating, eating a whole food plant-based diet prevents, treats, and re reverses diseases. That's what every single study will say and show. And that's what we see clinically. But interesting thing is animal proteins and saturated fats do not prevent disease. They do not treat any diseases and they do not reverse any diseases. Now there is little short-term games of weight loss of people try to do some paleo or keto diets and all short-term. But when you look at the 134 meta-analysis reviews of the studies that have been published, again, it's just short-term benefit, long-term problems because of all these things here. So don't get you know stuck on, well, I just lost a couple of pounds being a super low carbohydrate diet. You will have more problems going forward. And there's no study again showing that it will prevent your heart disease or prevent your, your cancer or lower your risk of breast cancer, colon cancer, or lower your rates of diabetes or dementias or anything like that. So they only increase it. So always look for what is actually occurring and what has actually data to show that will give you health benefits. Now, Again, if you have any questions about those things, go back to my, my read my book or see my, my previous lectures. I'll go into each of those sections in further, further detail. But for today, I want to talk about the stacking. So the stacking, aside of just eating animal proteins in various forms, is that we want to talk about food sensitivities. And this is something that I specifically specialize in my practice, because if those who, who know my story or read my book or seen my videos, I was someone who had a, a very severe food sensitivity uh, reaction uh, since I was a child. I actually have, I'm one of the peanut kids. I have a severe anaphylactic reaction to peanuts, but I also had a strong reaction later on, which you'll find out my, in my story of having a large delayed for a food as well that I was eating all the time that caused a chronic eczema in my body for decades. Uh, and it wasn't until we started investigating, we now know that there's two types of reactions from eating a food. Now, we have something called IgE, and I always just say E for immediate, just kind of kind of remember that, just like a loosely uh, way to remember that. It's, a, it's like within an hour, you're getting a reaction. Now, 
2%, and I'm in this unfortunate 2%, but 2% of people can have uh, an immediate reaction that's life-threatening. So we eat something and we get you know, swelling of our lips, we get swelling of our mouth, um, trouble breathing, um, cardiovascular problems as well, life-threatening. So these are people who carry an EpiPen, maybe an inhaler, maybe you know, some kind of acute remedies, or we have to go to the hospital, for example. Think of immediates though like a text here. You know, when you get a text, most people in the United States right now, within an hour, they re respond like they're pretty fast. They get something, bloop, 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 blink, they send it again, right? So that the response. So when you eat a food that's an IgE, it's an immediate reaction. Within an hour, your body's sending some kind of inflammation. The problem is the following here. Conventionally, in conventional medicine, we were only taught to look for the anaphylaxis reaction. So when they do a food panel conventionally, they'll usually test for about eight to 10 things, right? Peanuts, shellfish, melons, you know, dairy, eggs, wheat, uh, you know, maybe some soy or, or corn, things that, you know, in the past people really had a life-threatening issue. But if you don't have a life-threatening issue, you can still have 98% of people can have a, a inflammatory response, but it's not life-threatening. So what does that mean? You can eat something and have heartburn. You can have bloating. You can have diarrhea. You can have constipation. You can have a headache. You can have brain fog. My joints hurts. I'm chronically fatigued. Whatever the inflammation, whatever the itis is of your body and where it likes to go, it can happen from eating a food that you have an IgE within an hour. Again, the problem is conventionally, if you get tested, they may test eight things, 10 things. And if those are negative, they'll say, well, you don't have any food allergies or food sensitivities. And that's true of those 10 things, maybe. But what about the other 50 or 60 foods that you other also eat every day? That's the issue. So a lot of people go, oh, my doctor tested me. I don't have food sensitivities. But every time I eat something, I either have a reaction or they say, I have this chronic inflammatory reaction and I don't know why it's coming in or what's happening here. I think I eat a healthy diet. I'm eating Mediterranean or I'm eating plant-based or I'm eating keto. They're still having a problem. We have to look at any food, plant, animal, vegetable, grain, or legume that's coming in that's triggering this response. The second type of response is called an IgG4. It's a delayed reaction. It can happen a few hours after you're eating something. So say somebody had something for breakfast, they could have some symptoms at lunchtime or dinner that evening. or up to four days later. Okay. So think of it like regular old fashioned mail. You lick it, you write a note, you lick a stamp, you stick it on the envelope, you drop it off at the post office. And it can take usually anywhere from one day to four days to get across wherever the mail you're trying to send in the United States. Okay. It's not life threatening. It's not anaphylaxis, but it still triggers inflammation. So the problem is then this is something that's even more difficult to find because if you're having a chronic inflammatory problem like joint pain or a chronic you know, migraine headaches, it could have that today's problem could have been something that you had four days before or three days ago or yesterday. And since it's not an immediate where you eat it, I can't breathe, then most people will miss the concept of, well, how long or what was that that I last ate to do that? So doing diet diaries are very difficult to, to attain your um, IgG force and even doing a diet diary to look at an immediate reaction because unless it's life threatening, people will miss it too. So for foods, you can have both an either immediate, you can have a delayed, you can have both, which we call double whammies, punch, punch, or you can mostly, hopefully we have none. So you can eat a food and not have that reaction. And you can have this, you know, food sensitivity to any food again. So even though we want people to move plant-based, you can still have a problem with the plant. You can still have a problem with, you know, oranges or avocados or kale. So even if it's a superfood for someone else, we don't want someone else to say, okay, now I'm just putting kale in my smoothie or maybe having some kind of green uh, concentrated powder drink. And then that's still triggering an inflammatory response due to their immune system thinking that it's a problem. Now, other one thing I want to say is that MDs order this and they only give you a few. Naturopaths, chiropractors, and some of the other you know, functional practitioners can only order uh, the delays. And so a lot of people will come to my office and have this. They'll say, oh, well, I have a, a list of 100 things that I, I on my food panel. I go, does it have any IgEs? They go, I don't know. I look at it, it's just as a G4, then you're missing 50%. Other patients will go to the regular doctor and then come to me and say, oh, my regular doctor, my primary or my, my allergist uh, did a food panel on me. Okay, let's see. There's 10 things. And they said they're negative. Like, okay, you're not allergic to those 10 things, but we don't have a delay of those 10 things. So we don't know if it's hitting you later. And more importantly, we don't know about the other 50 or 60 foods that we commonly eat as well that are doing either or. So what happens is most people are getting mistested because they're only doing partial on this side 
or partial on this side and not getting the full results. When we test for patients uh, looking at their sensitivities, we like to look at the both the immediate and the delayed for each food. So we know whether it's an apple, is it hitting you now or later? If it's a banana, is it hitting you now or later? If it's beef or corn or chicken or soy or, or tomatoes, we want to know, like, is it now or later? If you're only getting part of the information, then you're not going to get fully recovered and improving your health to the best of your, your abilities. So when we say the stacking effects, let me just give you an example, okay? Here's your levy points on the right-hand side. And then the severity of the inflammation Remember, we're not talking about anaphylaxis where you eat something and you're gonna have this immediate, I gotta to go to the emergency room. We're just talking about what just triggers itis, inflammation of any of those 200 different itises that you can get. So when we look at the severity of inflammation, it's based on two factors, how much the amount or the volume you consume and the frequency, how often do you consume it? So it's kind of like, you know, well, how much fuel you put on a fire and how often do you put that fuel and how much of that creates more fire? right? So let's just give an example. If someone comes in and, and we do their testing and we test 64 different foods, right? We have a, a plant panel. We also have a regular panel that has animal proteins because we still want people to eat the lesser of as they're transitioning to. Remember, we're, we're, not, we're not talking about perfection. We're talking about realistically. So we realistically, we want to look at, well, still some people might eat animal protein. Um, so we still want to look at what is the lessers of those animal proteins that's not triggering even a higher amount of inflammation on top of the normal inflammation that animal protein will do. But say someone comes back with an IgE, an immediate and a delayed for wheat. Okay. We're not talking about gluten issue, just a wheat issue. Okay. Maybe they have an immediate for dairy. Again, they don't know. They love eating cheese and milk and ice cream, stuff like that. They have a little bit of delayed of tomato. They have an immediate for avocado and a little bit of delayed for chicken. And then there'll be a scoring that, you know, like how much one to five, one to six, for example. Now, none of these are life-threatening. So patients like this can say, what do they have? Well, I have chronic inflammation. I have, I have colitis. I have IBS, you know, gas or bloating, diarrhea, constipation. I have some depression. I have uh, high blood pressure. It's difficult to control. I have high cholesterol. I have a little bit of overweightness with a little bit of insulin resistance or blood sugar problems. Uh, and my joints hurt. Kind of the standard person walking around in America today. And, you know, chicken tacos, delicious, right? For most people say in America, like, hey, this is great. So, you know, we have a little bit of wheat tortilla. I couldn't find a corn tortilla picture. That's why I put wheat here, by the way. Okay, so <laughs> usually it's corn. So a wheat tortilla, if you had a restaurant, a, a, you know, some kind of chain restaurant, right? Because they sell wheat now more. But unfortunately, okay, so they're giving you wheat tortilla. You have some cheese, tomatoes, the salsa, you know, which has more tomatoes and the guac, you know, which is the avocado here and chicken. So this combination is stacking, right? So like if the person just had, say, a little bit of tomatoes in a salad, or just a little bit of guacamole with chips, you know, they might be right here on the right hand side. It's just the normal level of inflammation. They haven't crossed that levy point. Now we put this all together, the stacking of all these ingredients right here in the middle, and boom, they've crossed this levy point, and now they're having the reaction. Now, the problem is, say someone's going to say, well, gosh, you know, this is delicious. I like this. Now I have three of them, even more so, right? Because now we're stacking, and then we're stacking that stack that triggers this bam explosion and people will have a flare that's why people go gosh you know i had an ibs bout or had a joint bout or had a migraine headache it just comes out of nowhere i did everything the same last week and and, and i didn't have a headache and then now i have a headache or some kind of pain or dysfunction now it's just the stacking effect now this is just the food aspect of the amount and the frequency that you're eating we're not talking about other things that lower this or changes threshold in terms of sleep, in terms of stress, in terms of other things in the environment that also contribute to inflammation. So just the food itself is the largest contributing factor, but it gets worse based on how much other things that are also stacking outside of foods, which I'm going to cover right now. So other things that can stack for inflammation is obesity, right? So like 70% of the United States is now overweight right? And I think 13% is morbidly obese now, right? With the BMI over 40. That'll be in one of my previous lectures. On, you can go see that on the internet. So obesity now increases all these things. Have higher blood pressure, you have higher diabetes, you have higher heart disease, you have increased risk of clotting and a decreased immune system functioning just with having a little bit of weight. That's too much. And we all are privy to this. I mean, we're not, we're not immune from the, the, the last pandemic of us, you know, not exercising as much or having to, you know, eat, you know, have food delivered and, and, and not socializing. So people kind of tend to, to eat, feed themselves, you know, the, the, the stress. 
uh, that we're drinking more, eating more, smoking more, you know, <laughs> uh, doing these things because we were stuck indoors. But these all trigger inflammatory responses. Okay, so all these kidney, you know, kidney problems, heart disease, lung problems is all exacerbated. Even people who have COVID, again, the reason why Americans died more than any other country is because we carry more of these risk factors along with this. So when the virus came, it just had a higher rate of causing further damage to our bodies that our body was already fighting. So if you have already fire in multiple parts of the house, there's fire in the basement, a little fire in the kitchen, fire in the bedroom, and then this, this virus came in and just went right running through the whole house with a the flame, then the whole house was burning down. And unfortunately, that's why still going forward, 30% of Americans who are asymptomatic meaning they didn't have to go to the hospital, who got COVID, have what they call long hauler syndrome. And these are chronic inflammatory responses that are now, we have to go back and repair some of these things. And that's going to be chronic fatigue and cognition and memory problems are the two largest things at 30% of, of Americans now who have had COVID will have continuing going forward. Now, the stacking effect of chemicals. So when we think of chemicals, and there's a lot of people on the panels uh, in this conference that are experts in this area, and they just will talk just about, you know, GMOs and glyphosates and all. But remember, the stacking effect is of all of this. So aside of the, say, the chicken tacos that I mentioned before, then we have to talk about, well, what about what was sprayed on those foods? And what was sprayed in the yard that the person's walking around barefooted and spraying with pesticides and herbicides? You know, what about all the preservatives now that are being in packaged foods and things that, you know, have this long health shelf life and then we're, we're buying it and it's coming from all sorts of different countries because, you know, that's where they grow it and then they can preserve it. But what, what is the safety of these chemicals and how long and how much should be using? That's why we're trying to go for more whole foods and more fresh foods like your great grandparents or your grandparents used to did, used to consume. Preservatives, xenoestrogens, these are all the different kind of hormonals uh, estrogens that come from plastics, MTBE. These are all things actually we, we can test and we test in our clinic. MTBE is a, is a gasoline additive. It is found in a majority of our patients now. You don't have to be living in Texas near some fracking field. We now know that there's so much waste that's being dumped that we don't know in our ground tape or in our water that we can actually start seeing this now. Um, and that's been classified as a potential carcinogen uh, by the EPA. And more recently, if anybody's been paying attention to the news, this last week, uh, a study came out on microplastics. Two of them, in fact. Microplastics have been found. So microplastics are the tiny little, little particles that come from plastic that we ingest from fish. We have a huge amount of, so those people are like, oh, I eat Mediterranean, I eat my wild caught salmon, I'm eating my, my cod and my, you know, all my other fatty fishes that I'm supposed to eat, um, is, is full of having microplastic. And for those people who drink from bottled water, right? All these packages, oh, they're drinking sodas and waters and everything. Everything is coming in from plastic. And unfortunately, in the studies also, infants are now, because, you know, all the infant bottles, everything that they're feeding with the baby is coming from plastic. So there's 50% more plas microplastic found in the stool samples of patients that have IBS, irritable bowel, diarrhea, and constipation. What does this mean is that these microplastics are also causing inflammation. These also carry xenoestrogen. So when we look at these higher rates of estrogen positive breast cancers and other types of things, that these are things that we're getting every day that we don't even know that would need to clean up our environment. Now, this week, the study showed that 80% of healthy people that volunteered for the study, this is brand new, it's something that we didn't know that could occur, they actually found the microplastic in their blood. Now that should just like, everybody should just be dropping right now. Like their jaw should be falling down because the microplastic in the blood, we have no idea. And what they did right now in the animal studies now, because this was just in healthy patients, what they've been looking at in the animals, because they've been feeding the animals the same thing as the people, is they're finding out that the microplastics is now being kind of stored, particularly like in lung tissue right now, at least in the studies. They're also thinking it's going to be stored in liver and other things and actually affecting the red blood cells oxygen uptake. Right? So these are all putting chronic stress on the body, creating chronic inflammation in the people, putting higher risk of, of cancers because this is now being lodged. It's not that we're just pooping it out. It's having an effect of absorption. Uh, it's, it's have an effect on our blood, which is you know, traveling and, and through our body, giving nutrients. So now we're understanding you know, when we look at one in two men and one in three women in their lifetime getting cancer, these are some of the things aside of the diet that we all are expected to clean up. Again, alcohol, tobacco, um, 
you know, uh, are our key e-cigs. Please do not smoke or vape. And then finally, so, you know, one of the things that's interesting is something called copper. Now we're finding this excess copper when we do the testing in our patients, you know, there used to be copper deficiency 20 years ago. And, you know, copper was added to supplements. There would be like, you know, more zinc, 15 milligrams of zinc, 20 milligrams of zinc, for example. And then there was a half a milligram to one milligram of copper because they want to have a little bit of copper in the diet. Nowadays, what we do is we see the testing and we don't know why, but people's copper is off the chart. And that just tells us that there is some kind of industry that I don't know about. Maybe maybe some of the other uh, panel uh, scientists and, and people who are more into the environment will know about this. But there's some kind of industry that's using a high amount of copper that they're dumping into food supply or water supply. Because when we see patients from all around the country, it doesn't matter whether they work in an office, where they work out in the field, whether they, you know, they're a homemaker or they're a corporate executive, we start seeing this high copper level. Now, why that's important? Because high copper level is related to decreased immune system and putting the patients in a higher pro-inflammatory state. Right. And so we look at what they call a zinc copper ratio. And that's why having, you know, zinc foods, importantly, and also zinc supplementation, if the patient is low in their zinc, when we test them is super important because we have to shift this. Now, one of the funny things that I see companies selling now, like hydrosols of copper, or there's all these supplement companies that are selling copper for all these nutritional benefits, but they're not testing patient copper levels. So if most people are coming back already toxic or high, why would I want to give a supplement that would make that worse? So you have to be careful of just because something is natural or something is like someone's selling you uh, some information, you have to understand where that information or you know, how does that apply to you, not just to some general marketing campaign. Now, chemicals. So let's go further on the chemicals. So before I was talking about like some of the environment, like glyphosate and all those things, right? Like glyphosate, which is, let me go back here. This right here in my book, and there's other doctors that will talk about it in the panel uh, and these lectures this week, but this is the really my understanding and my, my assumption, which has now been proven by other uh, documents and, and, and uh, research articles and, and studies. You know, when people have a gluten sensitivity, it's not the, the, the gluten itself, it's the glyphosate that binds to gluten and gliadin in wheat. I wrote about this in my book. Uh, because that was the, the data coming out of Europe in multiple you know, studies, uh, it was shown that, that from the introduction of this glyphosate, there's, there's about 22 statistically uh, significant increase in diseases based on this addition of you know, the glyphosate into the food supply. And so uh, we don't see it in countries that don't have that problem. We do see it in countries that do, and America is the country that has the biggest use of, uh, of that ingredient. So when people look at, you know, oh, I can't eat gluten or I'm, I have to go, you know, grain free, it's not the grains problem. It's what we've done to the green. Remember, Jesus was eating bread and breaking bread. I mean, every culture for millennia on down uh, has some kind of bread or grain like food. And a lot of people are trying to push this anti grain. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to go back to what. Our, our ancestors or what our grandparents or what we did like 40 years ago before we started really using a lot of these chemicals that are disrupting our microbiome and disrupting our health. Again, my microbiome lecture that was given, go back and listen to that. I'll talk about how it affects the gut lining and leaky gut and inflammation and absorption and all sorts of other aspects. Now, going back to the stacking effects of chemicals. So right now there's about 84,000 chemicals that are being used on a daily basis in products. Now, the sad thing is out of which only 1% has ever been tested for safety, right? So again, jaw should be dropping right now. If there was an audience, I could see his jaw drop if they were there. Um, women on average, you know, they, had, they use 12 products a day on their body. You know, I'm just like that shampoo, conditioner, you know, deodorants, perfumes, you know, makeup, and, and men use six on average, right? So women are getting exposed to 168 different chemicals a day and men about 85 different chemicals a day, which on par most likely have not been tested for any kind of safety. So remember, skin is your largest organ. So yes, we talked about eating food, try to get cleaner food, try to be more plant-based. But what a lot of people are like, oh, I'm plant-based I or I'm eating you know, more organic. And then they just go to the regular store and they're just buying all sorts of stuff, their deodorants and their perfumes and their makeup and their shampoos and, the, and their hair gels and 
body sprays. They've now shown that, you know, even some of these men's body sprays actually decrease their testosterone production. So you see all these commercials where the young man gets like in an elevator, they spray themselves and they're trying to attract women, but actually physiologically, he's actually doing the opposite. He should actually lower their testosterone levels. So it's very funny. We have to be careful of this marketing. We didn't have to use all these chemicals. But remember, most of these chemicals that are in these products are what they call inert ingredients. And I write about this in my book. Inert ingredients meaning that they're not the ingredient that is used to actually have any form and function. They're just a filler, okay? So when you look at a shampoo, for example, there might be 50 ingredients, but most of those ingredients are not to lather and to make your hair all clean and shiny. These are inert ingredients that are bought from chemical companies and they get a tax credit for the swap. So these companies will get a tax credit. And I wrote about this in my book. You can read about it further, but... There's big companies like, say, DuPont and, you know, uh, you know, all these other big companies that, you know, that, that they make chemicals. And we need to, you know, we have to have, you know, the, unfortunately, there's going to be always chemicals because when we make something, there's going to be process of making, you know, other byproducts. There's no way that we can be away from it. But we actually make too much of it, right? We, we're not recycling. We're using a lot of things that are just like throwaway once one container use products. So in that production, there's byproduct. Now that byproduct, instead of throwing it away, which costs companies money, what they do is they resell that as an inert ingredient and another company will buy it and get a tax credit for buying the other company's waste and they put it to fill products. So when you look at in my book, we'll talk about it for women who want who use lipstick, like how many pounds of lipstick over your lifetime have you consumed just putting it on your lips? Then when you look at, okay, well, it has a little bit of lead or it has a little bit of mercury, it has a little bit of cadmium or these other heavy metals that are coming in. How much does that now pertain, pertain to having another contributory risk factor of inflammation and potential risk of having higher cancers on top of the diet, on top of the stress, on top of everything else? These are things that inadvertently everyday people are using. And with a look at, like, like I mentioned before, a little bit of everything. So it doesn't mean you go home right now and throw out everything. I just tell my patients really realistically, the next time your bottle runs out, buy something cleaner and greener. The next time your lipstick runs out, buy something cleaner and greener. Like you do that slowly. Otherwise, it can, it can be very expensive and not everybody's on a budget now. And I'm really conscious of budget for my patients. You know, we live in New Mexico. We're a very poor state. So we're very, I'm very understanding of understanding like that money is, is tight for everyone. So we want to look at small changes that have profound, profound benefits. You know, we're not going to be a celebrity and go, oh, well, I just have everything. And here's my website and, you know, blah, blah. I can buy all these expensive products. No, it's not like that. We look at what can the average person who's going to go to Walmart today or Target today or any big box store buy something on Amazon, what can they do to make their life better and lower their inflammation? So all these things here, again, remember, try to go for cleaner, cleaner and greener. Now, the stacking effect of chemicals. So with our patients, one of the things that we do is we actually test and we see, are they exposed to chemicals? Is their body getting rid of stored chemicals? Now, some people will come back and, you know, you can see here there's lead and mercury and arsenic and cadmium all the way down to uranium, right? And this person right here has a little bit of aluminum, a little bit of cadmium, a little bit of nickel. Now, the thing is that these things are neurotoxins. These cause inflammation. They suppress the immune system. They're not. Now, it doesn't mean that this person will have cancer, but can they have a little bit of higher risk of cognitive problems like dementia? Absolutely. Can they have other inflammatory issues with their joints? Absolutely. The thing is that we don't challenge patients on the, the testing, meaning there's a lot of what I consider malpractice in which people will take a chelating agent. You'll see clinics doing this all the time. They challenge the person to take a, a, what they call an oral chelating agent. Then they have the patient urinate. They go draw the, the heavy metals out and they go, oh, you have high heavy metals. And then they got to sell you chelation. That's inappropriate. What we want to do is just measure like from your just normal urination, is your body excreting something that's high? And if it's higher than normal that the government says this is the normal range, then it's considered a toxicity. Now, not every toxicity is going to be life-threatening, but it's just one of those other systemic factors of triggering inflammation and immune system dysfunction. And we can test it. Like in my state, we have a lot of patients that come back high with uranium. Why? Because we have uranium coming in our tap water at a high level. And other people I saw the other day, someone had you know, rubidium really high. Someone had cadmium super high the other day. Someone has lead and mercury. You know, mercury is one of the most common toxins. Number one cause of mercury toxicity is not from fillings that people will always want to be thinking about. It's actually from fish, right? From the ocean. My book will cover that. But what's the number two cause of mercury toxicity in patients? Chicken. 
Why is that? Because 99% of chicken is grown in a feedlot. And what do they feed the chicken? Fish meal. So that mercury is bioconcentrating from the fish product byproduct now into the chicken. And then people go to the fast food restaurant where there's a chicken and a pickle and a bun. They stand in this double drive through and they, they, in our state, we have all these restaurants like that. And people in our state, since we're landlocked, don't eat much fish because we don't have the ocean. We're not here like, you know, in Boston or like San Francisco where they have like some kind of fish. We, we have very, you know, not really fresh fish. Uh, seafood, obviously, because we live in the desert. So a lot of people eat chicken, 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 chicken. They come to my office, they're super high in mercury and say, I don't eat fish. I go, but your chicken does. So again, cleaning up the food that's bioconcentrating, my book will cover that in detail as well. Stacking effect of chemicals goes further back. Yesterday, we had this discussion on water in the panel. And I just recommend everybody go to environmental working group, ewg.org type in water database or look up the water database icon and then type your um, zip code in and it will tell you your water report. And this is ours in Albuquerque. Just to give you an example. You can see like we have 585 times more arsenic than we should. And we have all these like, you know, halo acetic acids that are cancer causing and, and radiums and uraniums. This is just tap water. Now this is going through municipal. So, you know, it doesn't have E. coli. It doesn't have bacteria. They're not going to get a diarrheal infection. It's been sterilized for that. But what they're not filtering out is all the other chemicals that are being spilled that you dump back into your sink or your toilet. Even doesn't, this is what this test doesn't tell us is also all the pharmaceutical drugs. My book will cover that. Which city has the highest pharmaceutical drugs of which drug, depending on where you live. So if you live in Houston, you're going to have a lot more chemotherapies due to the mega complex of MD Anderson, UT, you know, University of Texas and Baylor, all these huge cancer hospitals. Every time somebody gets chemotherapy, they urinate it. That chemotherapy goes back into municipal, comes right back being filtered out. It filters up the bacteria. So it's safe to drink. You won't get sick from a bacterial infection, but we can't do that with the chemicals. Highest antidepressants in Seattle, highest amount of Xanax in New York City, highest amount of hormones in Las Vegas obviously. Um, and so when we test, you know, when we look at the water, then we want to look at, well, what can the people, what can the patient do? Do they need what kind of filter? Sometimes all they need is just a simple carbon filter that goes on the back of their fridge, something super cheap, or, you know, one of those things you get in the pictures, you can get those brands, but then it will also tell us if those things do not filter them out, like it doesn't take out a uranium, then they might have to do like a reverse osmosis and then add some trace minerals back because you want your water to be clean because we're cooking with it, we're drinking with it all day long. That can have chemicals that are causing another aspect of inflammation in your body. And remember, we're trying to drink more and more. We're trying to hydrate, right, every day. Like drink at least six glasses of water or try to get more hydrated because most of us kind of chronically are dehydrated, particularly as we get older, we're not drinking enough or people who super exercise and there's still a little bit of dehydration, you know? So the thing is, we don't want to be having the water that is actually having also chemicals. So having some kind of filtered water, but avoiding the plastic uh, uh, aspect. Don't buy bottled water, try to get a filter. It comes out much, much cheaper. And we spoke about that yesterday on the panel. So if those people wanna go back and hear that discussion, definitely go back and listen to that. Now, stress can cause inflammation, right? Insomnia, anxiety, depression, anger. We all have these emotions. These are not diseases, by the way, even though drug companies like to do that and call them a disease, these are just imbalances of normal behaviors that become excessive. The problem is these also trigger inflammation. You know, there's a study that I always like to tell my patients that you know, in the biosphere, that was that study where they put those, 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 those people that were kind of like astronauts in that dome in Arizona, pure air, pure water. They were like super smart. They were like astronaut type people. They have multi talents of education of, you know, P triple PhDs and stuff like that. And they put them in this biosphere to, you know, check like if they were going to go like to a different planet, like a lab rat of humans in this like perfectly controlled environment. Two of the people didn't get along. And over a period of time, even though the water was pure, and the air oxygen was pumped in as pure. And then the food was, is, you know, organic and, you know, pure. And their body mass index, meaning they exercise and they all were fit and all stuff. Two of them didn't get along and they didn't like each other. And they were stuck in there for many years. And their inflammatory markers in their blood were off the chart. So you can control, like someone can say, hey, I'm eating a whole food plant-based diet. I eat organic. I don't use, you know, I use green and clean products and they hate their job or they hate their relationship or they're angry at their, you know, family members or they're just, you know, they're, or they're, or they're just consumed with the news, 
all day long and getting you know angry at that. And that can trigger inflammatory response. And then we can actually show and demonstrate that inflammation. And that's why we want to help reduce the stress uh, by other means, which I'll explain in a minute as well. So what are the solutions? Let's talk about solutions now, right? So remember stacking foods, the environment, and even mentally and emotionally and spiritually, like we can have those emotions trigger inflammation. So let's talk about solutions. What can we do to help now reduce the inflammation? So let's start with a diet. Diet, you want to be eating, you know, a rainbow colored food. You read my book, you watch the other videos. I'll explain why, what a phytonutrient is, what an antioxidant is, what fiber is, you know, uh, what, what's an anti-inflammatory protein. That will all be discussed before in my book and my other videos. So please, if you don't know what that is, do go, go back and read those things or listen to those things. We need 50 grams a day of, of protein uh, as a female on average, 60 grams for a male. We need at least 35 grams of fiber hydrate. Okay. Now you don't need more. Everybody's like protein, like, uh, like crazy. No, it's the efficiency of the protein. It's the anti-inflammatory. Is it damaging or not your kidneys? And so when we look at colon cancer rates in other countries that are eating tons and tons of fiber, like in Africa, you know, Africa has the lowest rate of colon cancer in certain parts of rural Africa. They're having almost 60 grams plus of fiber a day just because they don't eat anything from a package in rural countries, right? It's just straight fresh from the farm. Not even, you know, I still have packaged items, even if it's, you know, plant-based, but, you know, we still live in a world where there's convenience, but when they don't even have that convenience, their higher fiber rates actually lowers their colon cancer risk to the point where it's almost non-existent, less than one in a hundred thousand. And yet here it's the number two cause of death of cancer in both men and women is um, colon cancer. So eating more plant-based foods, anti-inflammatory foods, okay, will improve your BMI, will improve lowering inflammation. I do recommending food it's food sensitivity testing. Uh, that's something that you know you can contact our office and set up an appointment, but we can definitely do that for you. We check all the foods, plants, animals, vegetables, grains, and legumes. Again, we're trying to transition people to eat healthy, but some people might say, well, you know, I still need to eat a little salmon or I still need a little bit of eggs or I still need to have a little of this or that. We still want to check all the foods, whether they're immediate or whether they're de uh, delayed. So like on this person here, grape and raisin, they have an immediate for the grape and raisin and a delayed. Now, this person definitely, they were actually telling me like, oh, they drink a glass of wine every night with dinner. Oh, they heard it was good for their heart health. It helps them, you know, her and her husband does kind of relax at the end of the day of a hard work day. And, you know, they're not buying the cheapest wine. They're not also buying the most expensive wine. So saying, you know, it's kind of like in a beverage to help, you know, you know, kind of take the edge off. But what she didn't understand that that is triggering an inflammatory response within an hour of her consuming it. And then up to three to four days later, she can have another, a little bit of a reaction. So she's having it every night for dinner her chronic inflammation state, that's one thing on top of some of these other things. So again, she had some fajitas or she had maybe had some, you know, maybe some peppers or maybe a, a wild caught salmon with some tomato sauce or some chopped tomatoes on that. And maybe in the morning she had some cashew butter, you know, and maybe, you know, uh, maybe a, a, some hot chocolate or maybe a piece of, you know, dark chocolate. These are all the things that would be stacking in that patient. Now, one thing that we can teach our patients is not only what is the trigger of their inflammatory foods, but it's not just avoiding it. We will then teach the person how to reintroduce it specifically. So your body is going to learn to like it again. So it's not a foreign invader. And by doing so, we also have to check the microbiome. We always have to fix the microbiome. So go back to the microbiome lecture, because I'll explain how we do that systemically uh, and systematically to make sure that the patient is able to tolerate more of these foods. In the beginning, it is going to be some avoidance, but later on, a lot of these foods like the cacao and the, and the cantaloupes and the garlic and the, and the raisins and, and the bell peppers and the quinoa are very, very good for you. So we want to have those nutrients back in the body, but there's a specific way that you can train your immune system so it's no longer attacking or triggering inflammatory responses. Now, other ways to avoid inflammation is exercise. Yeah, I have a whole section in my book talking about yoga, uh, all the clinical benefits of yoga, you know, even doing a little bit of cardiovascular, doing a little bit of weight training for those people, especially who have osteoporosis. 20 minutes twice a day of just walking. That could be, if that's the simplest thing you can do, your numbers will be great. Your HDL will go up. Your blood sugar will get better. Your blood pressure, 20 minutes twice a day is the minimum that we need to be doing, okay? And here's my dog, that, you know, Winnie, that comes to our clinic every day. She's our therapy dog. She joins us in yoga. So just letting you know, if you ever come to our clinic, you see her, she'll be in the class as well. Um, meditation and mindfulness, super important. Remember I showed you that stress. I showed you the anger, the the depression, the insomnia, you know, the anxiety, 
well, how do we calm that down? You know, conventionally people think, oh, I take an antidepressant, I take an anti-anxiety pill. That's not helping. It helps the symptoms, but it doesn't heal or, or fix or resolve the, the, the problem, right? Then people take these drugs for decades. And they come to me like, oh, I've been taking that for 30 years. I go, you're still depressed after 30 years. You're still having anxiety. No one's ever looked at why you have anxiety, right? We want to get to the root cause. Meditation and mindfulness, I like to call it more meditation right now. Um, but this other word, it's kind of kind of trending and popular. So, you know, anyways, um, people use mindfulness as well. But there's ways to actually monitor that. So those people who need help, like, you know, I can't, I can't meditate. We teach people to meditate in our clinic. Uh, we offer them that, that service. But we also say, like, you know, hey, somebody wants to do something at home with an app. You know, we'll teach them, like, hey, go to this website, grab this technology, and you can actually test your heart rate coherence. We can, you can learn and you can do some biofeedback and find out if you're doing a meditation or if you're just reading something or you're looking at a wonderful picture, maybe your grandchildren or, your, or maybe a sunset or, or, or maybe your spouse or your partner or a loved one or your, your favorite song is playing that you can put in your phone. We can measure, you know, is, is your heart rate coherence? Is the electrical impulse in between each beat balanced? And if it's balanced, you're in this parasympathetic state where your natural killer cell function is increased, which is your immune system. Your inflammatory responses will go down. Your blood sugar will improve. Your cardiovascular improvements will improve. improve. And more importantly, for cancer patients, patients that are in this state more often than not in, uh, with stage four cancer live the longest regardless of the treatments. Because when people are not stressed, remember, you're not triggering this whole you know, suppression of the immune system and explosion of inflammation in your body. So these are simple things. They're not drugs. It's not even someone that has trouble changing their diet, or maybe they they have they can't even eat much. Can we still help improve and lower inflammation uh, with and increase our immune system function with just our mind and body? Yes, this has been scientific, scientifically proven in hundreds of studies, and we actually can measure that. And now we can find what is their medicine. What what do they need to do? What do you need to do to get you into the zone? And what makes me get into the zone might be completely different. So now we have to bio-individualize our treatments, what foods you might need to be eating if you're plant-based, but what also foods you might need to avoid, you know, what type of exercise, maybe you have limitations. How do we modify the asanas and the yoga postures? Or how do we change the meditative practice so that you're in this state and not stressing out too much because you feel like you can't get relaxed? These are things that you can easily do. And we will definitely teach people in our clinic who come see us. And we also do Zoom consultations, by the way. So we see people all around the world. Now, other things I was talking about, filtering water. So again, like EWG. So this is like our Albuquerque water, just giving an example. So if someone just had an activated carbon you know, filter, like a Brita or Pure, for example, those things are at the back of the fridge. You know, it's helpful. As you can see, it pulls out a lot. But remember, I showed you like we have really high arsenic and we have really high uranium and, and chromiums and nitrates and radiums. It wouldn't take that out. So is this better than nothing? Absolutely. But is it good enough? No, it's not. Especially if we test someone's blood and they come back with something, something that's very high, sorry, their urine, and they come back with something that's very high, then that's becoming more their potential source of toxicity. And, and investing in something like a, just a generic reverse osmosis uh, would be best. Any kind of filtered water is better than none. But, you know, you always want to look at what might get better. Some people can distill water if they want to. That's fine. Um, but I just like to put a simple system that's not expensive. You definitely want to add trace minerals afterwards because reverse osmosis removes trace minerals. Um, and later on, I'll be giving a lecture uh, on our website uh, in a month or two on structuring water and how you can actually then change energetics of water. You really want to try to avoid tap water as much as you can and avoid the bottled water because you're getting the microplastics and it's just waste of the environment of more um, you know, plastic. So you know, th these are things that you know, the average family, you know, a, a reverse osmosis costs about $250 cost two cents a gallon afterwards. I see people go to the store, grocery store, 39 cents to 49 cents a gallon of water that they're trying to pay for. They are getting taken, right? Like you can literally buy a machine, put it underneath your sink or on top and filter your water and save lots and lots of money. But that it is a little bit more of an investment up front, but per your per grocery bill, you're definitely going to save money going down the line. Eating organic foods, okay? So go to Environmental Working Group, go look up Dirty Dozen, trying to, you know, when you eat these foods, which people should be eating, this is where you must be getting organic. You want to eat the top things that are heavily sprayed. That's those foods. So if you're eating peppers or strawberries or having strawberry jam for your children's uh, PB&J, then definitely needs to be organic. You're having kale or collard greens or peaches or cherries. or These are things that, you know, tomatoes, I'm having ketchup, I'm having salsa. 
those things should be organic. Oh, I'm doing celery juice. It should be organic. Why? Because it's the most heavily sprayed as, as of last year. Every year we, we update these lists. They update these lists. Avoid ultra processed foods. Again, packaged foods that are coming, especially from car windows, right? This is fast food. You want to lower your salt and you want to lower the sugar. That's also a whole section in my book. So I won't cover that right now. You want to use green cleaners. You want to make sure that you're also using clean body care. Okay. These are just some examples. So just, you know, you can go to any health store now, you can go online and you just want to have the environmental working group also even has like a skincare division where you can look at like what, what are the, how, how toxic, you know, they scored on a scale of one to 10, one being very low risk and 10 being high risk. And so you can look at, you know, what are the products based on the company? Cause some products, you know, some companies, believe it or not, not all their products are good. It might be like their soap is good, but their, or the shampoo is good, but the conditioner doesn't pass. So then they might sell you in a twin pack for cheaper. Like, no, you got to kind of go and navigate. But now they have apps for all these things. So it's easy to go through the store. You can scan a label and you can say, okay, is this good? I tell people the next shampoo bottle, the next soap bottle, the next cleaner, change it out in your house. And slowly over time, things will get better. And again, if you can go even further, I started now going more for cleaner clothing, supporting more local, supporting more smaller shops rather than sweatshops in other countries that are unfair labor practices. Use natural fibers. You know, a lot of people have skin issues and eczemas and dermatitis. You know, even the bedding that you're, you know, these are all the things that you can get now super cheap online. It's available. So it's not like it used to be like these were super expensive and you had to be, you know, a certain, you know, certain echelon of socioeconomics to get these kind of things. It's available now for everybody. You just have to shop that you know, shop a little bit more savvy or shop a little bit more smarter uh, because it's available and you can find good deals on most of these things, almost anything online now. Now, what can you do right now? I want to switch over to what can you take if you are already doing all the above or not, but you still have inflammation, what can you do? So I'm going to talk about, you know, what I have, uh, you know, my specialty is looking at natural anti-inflammatories, as you know. So aside of putting people on anti-inflammatory diet and checking all the things I mentioned before, like food sensitivities and going through the 10 epigenetic steps and the 10 definitive steps of preventing reversing disease, I want to talk about specifically lowering inflammation with targeted natural therapies. So first I want to talk about is, is our flagship, which we've used now for more than a decade, actually, we're the first people in the market to bring out this product over 12 years ago, actually, um, which is the combination formula of the strongest, what we consider natural anti-inflammatories that are available. It's patented. Um, we have the most researched form of curcumin. Now, I'll go into a little bit of detail because everybody thinks that they don't understand curcumin. Everybody talks about curcumin and turmeric very interchangeably. It's incorrect. Curcumin is this 3 to 5% of the turmeric root, so you can't just use them interchangeably. A lot of studies will actually use them interchangeably trying to say that's curcumin. They're actually talking about just the generic turmeric root. But we have the most efficacious form, in which is 165 peer-reviewed, non-company non funded studies. Right, so remember, there's a lot of people talking on on this on this on these panels and this and this conference, like, oh, well, the drug industry is always influenced because it's paid by the sponsors, and that's true, but the supplement country companies are just as bad. In fact, they're the only ones who sponsor it because they're the ones who have the product, right? So when we look at the kind of forms that we're doing, we're talking about independent studies that are done by research hospitals that are done by by cancer hospitals that are doing by by scientific uh, groups that are not paid for are paid consultants of the company. So that's how we can then look at getting stronger data. So we have 165, the most efficacious forms of all the four ingredients, okay? And, and plus more, and I'll show you one study that came out just more recently. Now, when we look at all the other major competitors, meaning patented other ingredient companies, they have about 25, okay? I'm talking about, there's five of their major companies, they have about 25. And most of them are white papers, and I'll explain what that is. All the other brands that you say, so 99%, 99.9% of products that you see on the market will not have any safety data or efficacy data. So when we look at something like this, I'm not going to say the names, but you can read them on the screen. These are all the big companies that you'll see that they're in the products that say, oh, faster, quicker, stronger. They all have very limited clinical data. At the end of the day, I'm evidence-based. Most of these companies have studies. Those studies are done in test tubes. Okay, not in an animal model and more importantly, not in even a human patient, right? They're, they're lucky if they have a small pilot study, 10 people in most of these studies, 12 people, 15 people. And most of them are white papers. What are white papers? White papers are important, by the way, 
But white papers are what we consider more advertorial scientific um, articles, meaning the, the company will pay for a doctor who's usually on the company to write a paper that will describe the product. And it's important because it helps move understanding and education about that ingredient or the data. But it's a white paper. So usually it's not peer reviewed. And usually it's not published in a, in, a, in a journal. It's usually just given out like a PR press release, right? So it's helpful for just getting the overall idea, but it's never truly verified. And it's not a clinical study or clinical trial than going through that rigorous data of looking at how well it's working. So when we just start seeing these claims now, 29, 45, 65, 128, 277 times more absorption. You'll see this of all these cur curcumin products and turmeric products now is they're not measuring what they should be measuring. And, and higher absorption does not equal higher efficacy. When we actually analyze these products, and I'm going to be doing a whole video series on our, our podcast coming up soon. So go to sangevity.net, sign up for our newsletter. We'll let you know when it's coming out. I'm going to be a whole, I'm going to go through each product on the market. And because now I'm just getting, I'm getting to a point where I'm getting tired of trying to explain this all the time. But then people can go like, this is the brand I'm taking. Is this good or not? And we'll say, this is the data it is. And a lot of people are not going to like what they hear because we've bought into, we've, we've been sold a lot of misinformation. What they're measuring is what they call metabolites. And one of them is, is what they call gluconorides. And those gluconorides now have been shown in the animal model and clinically not to have anti-inflammatory aspects. So when they have something that's 128, 277 times more absorbable of something that doesn't have anti-inflammatory effects, it's just 277 times or 65 times or 29 times more of nothing. But what happens is, it makes the ability that they can actually make lesser curcuminoids in the product, sometimes not even the right ones, and then have a higher profit margin. And usually sometimes sell it to you at a higher price because people think, well, I'm getting a faster, stronger, better one. And in fact, it's not. So we really want to make sure that when people take something, they actually get the true benefits. Now, these are just some other aspects so you can stop this, you know, I'll go back to this video, stop this uh, slide right here. You might be having this right now on your counter or in your pantry or, or even maybe you know, the doctor said, yeah, go ahead. That's fine. Let's take this. These are all the brands that don't have any. And that's just the few. I mean, I didn't want to have like 50 slides of the, of the brands, but these are the ones that if you went on to a generic online retailer like Amazon or Walmart, and you typed up you know, curcumin or you typed up turmeric or you typed up you know, bosmeric, it'll kind of come up because these are all the ones that are trying to copy the formula and the concept that we delivered early in the market of the synergy of using curcumin, boswellia, ginger, and black pepper. We were the first to do that, and we still are the first in terms of the leader of actually having safety, efficacy, and potency, and purity. Now, the problems with generic turmeric supplements are the following. Um, it's a big market. Like it continues to grow, 157 million. Ground turmeric is one of the largest sources of lead exposure in the United States. Okay, why is that? Because when they grind the rhizomes of the of the uh, turmeric, there's lead in the metal machine that grinds it. Because most of it's coming from China and other parts of India, mainly in China. So you know you have to make sure is it lead? Is it lead? Has it been tested for that? And again, most of them fail, and that's why we had this problem with patients having lead exposure. And then you'll see on the news like, oh, supplements have lead exposure. Don't take supplements. Well, there's a lot of products out there that are not tested for that. Um, they're also not pesticide free because remember, as a root product, any rhizome, ginger and turmeric and all these are heavily sprayed. They're crops on the ground. Right. So if they're not pesticide free, you might be thinking I'm taking this anti-inflammatory for my cancer or for my autoimmune. And then you're getting glyphosate or other types of herbicides and pesticides on it. Now, when we look at even like the top seller of one of the online retailers, we looked at them last month again and their base cost, like we can do all the backward calculations because we know how to do this. When you, when you manufacture and you grow products and you have like 400,000 acres in four countries of turmeric that is controlled vertically integrated, meaning we go right directly from the farm to the facility to you, we don't have anybody touch anything in between. We actually know exactly, just like the oil company will know exactly how much per bottle of uh, barrel of crude oil, how much your gasoline price will be. Right now, the, 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 the most selling product right now is less than $4 total, meaning 100 capsules of or 1,000 milligrams of each capsule of multiple ingredients with the label in the bottle. That's not possible. Okay, It's not possible to be actually real. And in fact, even if I were to get 
product from China and India would try to throw away. I mean, there's companies that contact us every day saying, hey, we can give you this bulk supply, super, super cheap. You still can't get it that, that cheap. So how do they get it that cheap? One of the ways is being synthetic. So the 43% of the largest supplier to the United States was recently found in a court case because they were being sued that they were selling synthetic curcumin. So almost across the board now. Now, again, most companies that sell turmeric just generically online don't even know this because they're just looking at, hey, they're giving me a good deal. This, this manufacturer is cheaper than that. But when we look at now all that, there was a study that came out. This was a university study, independent again. And they were looking at anti-inflammatory effects. I had a, con I had a, conference, uh, a conference where I met a, a, a research scientist and I made this comment. I said, well, you know, we use the top form. It's the most studied. And he's like, well, I don't trust anything until we actually look at a clinical study from ourselves. I said, fine. So I told him, you know, here's the ingredient. You can always, you know, get it from the company. And um, they went to the university, University of Kentucky did a study. They actually did it in the cell culture and in the animal. They took five of the top suppliers. Remember, what a lot of people don't understand about the, about the nutraceutical and the vitamin and mineral uh, and dietary supplement industry, it's those major base suppliers, right? So there's top five suppliers, aside of ours who makes the curcumin C3 complex, there's top five suppliers that sell the generic product of 95% curcuminoids to every single company. Right. So if you went to Whole Foods, you went to Walmart, you went to online retail, you go to vitamin shop and all, there's only going to be like five major suppliers that sell and it'll be of hundreds of brands. Right. Because there's just they sell it to someone, someone sells, and then there's a small local shop. And they tell you, this is in my state. They make supplements. I look for curcumin. They have it on supply. They make it. The five top suppliers, when we look at it in cell culture and an animal study, looking at does it have anti inflammatory effects and immunological benefits? And guess what? They don't. Most of them, those, so out of the five top suppliers, the only one that was shown to have clinical effect on lowering all aspects. Now, some of them had a little bit here, a little bit there, because remember, having a little bit is still going to give you benefit than none, obviously. But when we compare about like all the biomarkers of, of inflammation going down and all the immune markers getting stronger, the, the form that we use in Bosmeric was the only one that passes. Again, the reason why we're so specific on what we give and how and why our patients who use it and patients who've used it worldwide have had wonderful benefits. Now, what you want to be careful of is the newer forms. These are, these are commonly trendy things like turmeric oils. Well, now there's multiple studies that have been published. In fact, over like eight or nine, 10 years ago, so this is like old data, right? They were showing already that turmeric oils cause problems. Okay, it, it's actually pro-inflammatory. It actually can cause damage. Some parts of plants, when we hyper-extract them, can be beneficial. And some parts of plants, when you hyper-extract them and concentrate them, cannot be beneficial. And that's why nature's kind of kind of kept them in a certain way. So it's kind of like giving superheroes, you know, a, a person superpowers. Sometimes you can turn someone to a superhero, and that's really good. And sometimes we can turn someone into a super villain. And even though we thought that the idea was right, you can get a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. You know, the idea would be like, okay, this person's coming good. And then you have the split of the, the Marvel universe and you have something that's quite bad or a, a, an evil character. So turmeric oils are, is actually a problem. But right now, a lot of companies will say, well, we have turmeric oils making it sound like it's something better or new. And in fact, the data will actually show clinically and in the, and, 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 and the data will show that there is really caution to be taken. And more importantly, this really high trend of nanoparticles. Everybody wants to nanoparticle everything. Not everything is supposed to be made into nanoparticles because that's when the safety and efficacy is very, very challenging. There is no data on nanoparticles in general, but some of the data on nanoparticles with curcumin have shown actually toxic effects. And that's why most of the nanoparticles right now that are being sold are not being sold by major suppliers. They're sold by minor suppliers online direct to consumer because of that liability risk. And so you have to be really careful when someone says nanoparticles because safety data is far from little and of what we have, it's actually more dangerous than anything else that we've seen, particularly when they even give these things IV form. Uh, we have to be very careful. So when we look at Bosmeric, okay, it's a bilayered tablet. And I'll explain now all of the products are usually put in a capsule or just a regular tablet. We have it in a bilayered sustained release. And I'll explain why that's so important because it's all about understanding pharmacology and manufacturing. I mean, this is what I've been doing for 22 years. So a lot of people are like, oh, and right now you can go on Facebook or Instagram and literally you'll see an ad and I'll say like, hey, you can, be, you can sell your own supplements. Just sign up here, a minimum bottle of 12 and you put your name on it. And so everybody's a social media influencer selling products. There's a difference of actually understanding how that product is made, how it's produced and actually following clinically patients over years of, you know, is, are you getting the response rather than being a social media influencer? 
when we have this bilayer effect, the reason is the following. When you put any of the ingredients together in a capsule, so if you put boswellia, which is frankincense, okay, we have what they call boswell and PS, which is the patented form of the three different types of boswellia. You put curcumin, C3 complex, or you put any type of generic curcumin or turmeric or branded product of curcumin, and then you add ginger of any kind, you add bromelain of any kind, papain, ceratopeptidase, you know, any kind of proteolytic enzyme, natokinase, those when they're in the capsule and when they sit in the tablet actually degrade the other ingredients enzymatically as it sits in the capsule. So the potency of that tablet and that capsule will decrease over time as it's sitting on the shelf. Now, remember, they make it in a factory. It takes some time for them to ship it out. Then it goes to the warehouse and then it goes to all the grocery markets. And then you finally go pick it up. And then by the time it's been three, six months before you can get it, sometimes up to a year, it's still not expired. But the potency, meaning how well it actually works, is decreasing over time as it sits on the shelf. Well, we've ensured that your potency is 100% at the time you take it when you take. And that's the difference of getting a clinical efficacious product. Rather than I take something, I kind of get results. We want to actually get direct results. So we have a bilayered. So half the tablet is going to be, uh, has the Boswell and PS. Now my book and the other videos will go into all the different aspects of Boswellia because a lot of people will just use like essential oils and misinformation of understanding what data is applied for where. But we have this PS formula. We're the only person who had the polysol. That's that third fraction. There's Boswellic acids that people know. There's AKBBA, which a lot of people may know. But now we have the polysol. The polysol makes it uh, uh, water soluble. And it also makes it work within 20 minutes. So when people take our product, within 20 minutes, their inflammation is lowering. So if you have a migraine headache, you have a back pain, you have any kind of, you know, immediate, you need immediate relief. That's why most people went to pharmaceutical drugs. Right, because when they go to pharmaceutical drugs, I can take a fast tab, I can take a, a, a ibuprofen fast tab, a Tylenol fast tab, and they get that immediate. Oh my God, my 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 migraine headache is feeling better, or my joint pain is feeling better, my back pain is feeling better. And natural therapies kind of failed because it would take time, usually, to kick in. And sometimes it takes several days or several weeks with natural therapies. Here we want people to get that almost instant benefit where they feel like, wow, that's just like my fast tab without the side effects, without the black box warnings that you get with normal non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like ibuprofen or Motrin or Advil or naproxen. We add the ginger oils at the highest percent, 20%, and the bioprene, which I'll talk about in a minute, which helps improve its absorption, 60%, and it's also anti-inflammatory, okay? The curcumin, we have all the three different type of curcuminoids at this specific ratio. My book will cover it. All the other videos will cover it, so I won't go into detail now. And again, so it's a bilayered sustained release tablet. Now, what makes this very interesting is that when you actually look at the, so this is the gold standard data. When you actually use the right form of curcumin, this is how much it raises in the blood. Remember, it's a food particle. It's not supposed to be like super, super high. Now, when they use the bioprene, it actually will go up and come down nicely, okay? So it has this kind of peak. So that's why it improved the absorption 2,000% in the studies. Now, bioprene, not just black pepper. Generic black pepper does not do the same because the bioprene was patented on how they actually extracted the piperine compounds, not just the total amount. So again, a lot of people use 95% curcumin or, or piperine standardized. It's not the same because what the patent was looking at is how those things were extracted and what ratios that they were. Now, what we were able to do is with Bosmeric is that we looked at what else can we do to make this peak not only just go up and go down, but how do we make it sustain release? So we, by adding the Boswell and PS, you have this 20-minute onset. So if you just took normal curcumin, you know, it takes about an hour if you get the right form, right, with the, with the, with the black pepper, uh, with the bioprene. Right. But now we have this 20 minute onset of action and then we sustain release it. So instead of just having this peak and drop trough, we had now have this long lasting fast acting. We call it long lasting SR sustained release. So the issue is that when a lot of people have cancer, a lot of people see, see social media influencers and say, oh, well, I saw a study. It said that the, the C3 complex plus bioprene, I got to take grams and grams and grams a day for my cancer or grams and grams and grams a day for my autoimmune or my flares. The problem is they're just doing this up and down, up. And down. That's you know at that time that's what they, that was still giving them wonderful benefits. But can we give the right amount without overloading the system, making it more cost effective and more physiologically beneficial to keep them in that targeted range? And we can. Now I'm not going to go too much into this, but real quick, showing you just differences of what, what curcumin does, like all the herbs, like all the foods. By the way, 
they upregulate and downregulate. So it's not a suppressor only. It's just not turning off something like a lot of people think, well, it's like a natural ibuprofen. It's one molecule that has multiple effects. So we talk about over 100 mechanisms. My book will cover this in general, um, but there's monotargeted. So if someone takes a Celebrex or someone was taking Herceptin or Avastin or Plaxitaxel for their chemotherapy, curcumin works on that same pathway, but it also does dozens of inflammatory cytokines and enzymes and receptors and protein kinds. So there's hundreds and hundreds of things that is turning on singly and also kind of generally, right? So it's not just a suppressor. It's not just turning off things. And so again, my book will cover this, but just to show you, like there's a variety of aspects of how it interacts with your immune system and cellular function. It's not just only for pain. It's about modifying inflammation and immune system function for the benefit of turning on genes that are anti-cancer and then turning off other things that are pro-inflammatory and, and are damaging, okay? So a variety of aspects, I won't go into it in detail because I have other lectures that I've done that, but just showing you like, you know, even like the beta amyloid in the brain that causes Alzheimer's disease and all, how do we affect that? How do we look at metals and other inflammatory mo molecules? So there's a variety of that, these natural things, that's why we want people to move to a phytonutrient rich diet, right? Plant diet, because these things only come from plants. You're never going to get any of these phytonutrients from uh, an animal protein. Now, boswellia, the second ingredient real quick is, again, a lot of people know about boswellic acids, okay? But higher numbers doesn't mean that it's more effective. So what we did actually is it took us six years in the development because what we were able to do is look at each of these boswellia components. And I actually was telling them, you know, because from pharmacology and from kind of uh, Western science, we think more is better. So we would actually increase the amount to almost 100%. Here's more AKBBA. Here's more boswellic acids. And we push that ratio higher and higher. But when we would do the animal studies measuring the inflammatory response in the animal models, guess what? It didn't show the benefit. So we had to keep working up and down with each of the ratios to find what was nature providing that has that bam, that effect that lowers it down very quickly. And we were able to find it. And by the way, it's not all 90%. You'll see AKBBA 90%, 90%. Actually, that doesn't have more anti-inflammatory effects. We were just thinking that a lot of people said, well, there's 90%, it must be more. You have to just actually have to do the studies to find out what is that magic number that actually has the better benefit. Now, a lot of people also will look at this essential oils and multi-level marketing companies talking about essential oils in Botswana, frankincense, frankincense, frankincense. In fact, when I did my lectures many, many years ago on a, a couple of videos, uh, unfortunately, the market exploded because I talked about the Magi, I talked about Boswellia and frankincense, and you know the you know the Magi brought to Jesus these I, I, aspects. And then a lot of companies made like now up to like three to five billion dollars selling essential oils. But the idea is that when we actually look at the largest one of the largest suppliers in the United States of essential oils, it costs less than fifty cents a bottle, meaning ingredient, bottle, and label, and they're selling it for fifty to ninety-five dollars a bottle. It's not real Boswellia or it's adulterated or synthetic. And that's what now some of the independent reviews and studies will show. So you have to be careful when people are trying to say like, well, this is an essential oil. Essential oil has a benefit, but it's a different type of benefit than what we actually get in the polysol and the boswellic acids at AKBBA. There's a different aspect. So a lot of people will use a study that's based on one part of the plant and apply it to a different part of the plant in a different product two different aspects. So you can't apply apples to oranges. Now, it doesn't mean that the, the, the essential oil can't be used in a diffuser, can't help calm the mind, which it does. But when everybody's like, I'm drinking essential oils to help with my inflammatory response, I would not recommend anybody doing that. Now, again, I won't go into this in detail, but the three parts are in our product. It has a 20 minute onset of action. There's more preclinical and clinical studies with more safety data than any other Boswellia uh, extract. It has been generally recognized as safe. So we actually have grass status, which again, most uh, companies, supplement companies do not have grass status on their ingredients. Ours are always applied through and approved uh, because of the clinical data. Ginger, again, make sure that they don't have pesticides and herbicides. Um, make sure, you know, one thing that with all our herbs, is that we don't irradiate them. So just one thing is after 9-11, Bioterrorism Act that was passed, anything that comes through the United States, plant, vegetable, animal, grain, legume, kind of thing like that, it is irradiated because they want to make sure it didn't have any kind of bioterrorism ingredients like anthrax. The problem is that nothing is, is, is calibrated individually. So everything goes to the same machines and it's kind of sterilizes. So there is not bacteria on there, which is good, but also affects the bioavailability, the bioenergetic capacity of plants. That's why we don't like to microwave food, for example. So the problem is now that most things that are coming from the store, 
that, you know, most of these herbs are grown outside the country, by the way. Um, that's just where they grow them. Um, so they can still be organic, but if it's not, if it's not irradiated, then it's actually going to have a lower effect. Now, I would still have an organic, you know, irradiated food than a not. But the idea is that you want to have the physiological benefits. Then that's why when people say, how come your product is a little bit more expensive? We have to go through all these safety measures through the customs, through the, 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 the government to look at, like, we have to test and prove 10, 10 different ways why we don't have to irradiate it, but then why we still have no heavy metals, no pesticides, no solvents, no other molds and contaminants and everything more than any other company. You go on Amazon right now, you go to any retailer right now, you're buying something, you know, it's really a wild west. And we start seeing now more and more problems with toxicity. I just had a patient the other day, she had a reaction and her doctor said, stop taking your supplements. They probably have contaminants. She stopped and she started feeling better. And I'm like, well, it wasn't that the, her ideas were wrong. Her ideas were actually correct, but the products that she was taking was off mark. They're not tested for potency, purity, safety, and efficacy. And we want to raise this industry to be better, right? We just, we don't want everything to be drugs, but we have to kind of be in the same market to play on the same field. We have to be able to prove what we're saying and we have to stand on the science and, and of safety saying, well, this is safe. Otherwise right now we're getting heavily regulated where this industry is gonna slowly be pushed away. So make sure, again, like anytime someone puts ginger in a capsule, it will degrade the other ingredients over time and lower the effectiveness. That's why we have this bi-layered uh, sustain release. Uh, uh, again, non-irradiated, not, uh, no pesticides. Um, and ours is the highest amount of uh, paper, um, ginger rolls, 20% in the market. And then la uh, lastly, black pepper. Black pepper, you know, again, you know, a lot of people would say generic black pepper powder. It's not standardized for 95% per pe pepperine compounds in that specific way. It won't have the same physiological effect, even though it sounds the same. And again, irradiated, pesticide-free, that's what you want to look at. Black pepper does not cause health problems. So there's this huge myth that's been propagated by companies on the internet. It's usually companies who don't want to use pepperine in their products, other generic turmeric companies, curcumin companies. So what they want to do is they want to say those are, those is faster, better, quicker. And then by, by trying to make this myth that black pepper is dangerous, then they, they can actually increase their profit margins because there's one less ingredient that they have to put in. And again, since they're measuring metabolites, no one's ever caring about whether it works or not. We do. And so the, the thing is, like, you know, that almost every single table around the world has salt and pepper on it. Almost every food product that you'll get that's in a package will usually have a little bit of pepper in there. Pepper is not damaging or dangerous. What it actually is is a bioavailable enhancer, which helps absorb your ingredients. That's why we put pepper in food. It's also anti-inflammatory by itself. We have all the studies and everything in our book, an NF kappa beta blocker as well. So it is something that is, you know, we've been using for thousands of years. And all of a sudden there's some, you know, naturopath or some company saying like, well, there could be a problem and it can cause some problems in your gut and all. No, that's just all myths. Again, those are people who don't understand the science or just they're trying to be competitive and find a different way of not trying to knock something that they can't attain. It does increase the bioavailability when you're using the right form, bioprene, 30% up to 2,000%. So depending on which ingredient, like a CoQ10, all the way up to the curcumin. Again, certified, pesticide-free, non-irradiated, uh, non and grass status. So our product, again, is these are the ingredients. Here's our product, Bosmeric SR. You can go to bosmeric.com or you can go to sanjevanystore.com or look at our, our link. Here's kind of how it's going to look like. We, and again, we how we got these ratios was by testing. It wasn't just like, oh, we just put it together. Most people were just like, oh, I want to sell a curcumin extract on, on online and they'll just go grab something. That's not how it works. Now, the benefit of why we have all of these, and so when you look at Ayurvedic medicine, the traditional medicine of India, you look at Chinese medicine, you look at any indigenous medicine now, what we're, what we're missing in, in conventional medicine right now is everything is like a mono target, right? Like, like this is one ingredient, they just, here's your magic bullet. And now we understand when we look at all these indigenous and traditional medicines, it's about formula. It's about some things, what we're trying to do is prevent you from building a tolerance. We're trying to prevent also sometimes a potential side effect if you use something too long. And by balancing the formulas, that's the herbal medicine part that most nutraceutical companies, most naturopaths, most you know, holistic doctors or functional practitioners don't have any experience in doing. So they're like, oh, let me just put this one thing in here, put on high dose and then and blast my patients. And then over in the beginning, it might have some benefit and over time it will lose its efficacy. So we have to understand like we can now put things together and it can have a long-term benefit without burning out or causing side effects. So there's something called synergy. One plus one equals three. And so those people who understand formulations of herbal medicine and the pharmacology behind that, um, that's something that we can do. 
Again, synthetic free, nanoparticle free, you know, we're non irradiated, and we're all, you know, at the highest GMP standards. In fact, you know, the, the facility that it manufactures is audited twice a year because it, we supply products to clinical trials that are done in hospitals and phase studies, right? Phase one, phase two, phase three, phase four clinical studies. Because now the most, the biggest research with these ingredients is how do these things work synergistically with certain type of medications like chemotherapy. How can we make a chemotherapy more effective and less toxic? How can we make radiation more effective, less toxic? My book will cover that in detail with some of the examples of what the studies have shown and which medications they have been shown to become beneficial. Lastly, I want to just finish on a couple of things. I just had someone send this to me last week, so I just want to pull it up. Again, a lot of people are sending me things all the time. Deceptive marketing and from corporations. So uh, I, I gave a lecture uh, I was on, uh, I think, the YouTube about a, mo a month ago. And so someone sent this to me because they were looking at Bosmeric on Google. And this came up. It says Bosmeric SR. Hey, this is, my, this is my registered trademark. But guess what? This is a different company. And they're selling uh, this other generic, which I showed you before, right? That, that is from the test tubes and all that stuff like that. Like that's their, their ingredient. So this is how, you know, the sneakiness of large corporations is that they can use these tactics, right? Like you have a product that's good and they're trying to steal customers or steal my patients, for example, in getting. So the, someone will go here to their website. It's going to be 10 times fancier, beggar. They have, you know, multi-million dollar budget folks. And then they'll probably forget that, oh, I was looking for a boss merrick. And then this said, this is faster. This is maybe, you know, 50 times better or, or absorbed. So they might forget all the reason why I'm talking about this in the lecture because they get taken down the rabbit hole. You know, one thing I'll just let you know that for Amazon right now, Amazon has restrictions on claims. And so they will tell us, for example, if you make a claim, you have to show the reference for that claim. So when I say this is faster or better or quicker, here's the study. Here's the independent thing. And they keep on coming back because what happens is like, even if I say, hey, there's a study here showing 43% of the uh, turmeric on the market is synthetic, they won't allow me to put that on my listing. Why is that? It's because they make 25%, 30% on every turmeric product on the market, which is hundreds of them, which is making millions of dollars of profit for them. So they're trying to prohibit, you know, we think of online being this great marketplace, but there's actually stifling of growth of actually good product because more of everything is just more profit for one company, but it's not getting the access to the patients. So if I go to some of these bigger websites, they can make all the claims they want. Why don't they go after them for not? I look at them. They don't have a reference. They don't have any kind of backup of their information. They actually can make false charts where I can pull out a whole lecture of just false graphs all day long. But why don't they touch them is because they have over 100 products on Amazon and taking 25% profit of all those 100 products is more profitable for Amazon. So Amazon doesn't touch the big, big guys, but they like to come out to, against the small guys. But I'm always in for the good fight. And we've been here for a long time. And so we always stand on our patients uh, outcomes and we always stand on the on the data that we've been able to provide. So make sure that you I always tell people, you know, if you shop, try to shop directly to a small business. Uh, we're a small business, but any kind of product, you know, try to shop locally, try to shop as much as you can to help local rather than the large online retailers. We are in the long, our large online retailers, but we prefer people actually shop directly from us. Now, lastly, I want to finish. I know we have a few minutes. We have some questions, but I spoke on the last conference last year on COVID. And we talked about like there was about 10 or 12 research studies that were done at peer reviewed multi-center studies looking at curcumin, the kind that we're using. Uh, in our boss Merrick and different pathways of lowering inflammation for COVID, not a replacement, not a replacement for vaccines. Okay. So don't get me wrong. Don't hear me wrong. Don't say I can just take this, not take a vaccine. Not that saying that, but I'm saying like, what can we do to help lower the risk of inflammation when we get the virus or if we have exposure or, or near the virus and we have that compli how do we lower the complications? And to, to, to share with everybody, there was a wonderful double blinded randomized control clinical trial. This is the gold standard, clinicaltrials.gov. You can go find this up there. Okay. It's the gold standard. This is what we do with the pharmaceutical. This is the one that we want to see. The double. A lot of people say, well, that was a small study. Okay. That was this. This is a double blinded randomized clinical trial. They were using the C3 complex and the bioprene. That's the forms that we only use in our boss merrick. Okay. And it found that it had early recovery, less deterioration, fewer red flag signs, better oxygen saturation, better clinical outcomes than the control group. That was, you know, the randomized one that got a sugar pill. The doctors didn't know, the patients didn't know. And the conclusion was there's an adjunct symptomatic therapy in COVID-19 treatment that could substantially reduce morbidity and mortality and ease the logistical and supply-related burden on the healthcare system, safe and natural therapeutic option to prevent post-COVID uh, blood clotting events. 
So these are things like on top of eating in a plant-based diet, plant-based diet showed 79% lower reduction in inflammatory responses for those people who got COVID. So going plant-based, you know, being less stressed, taking your bosmera, taking your vitamin D, hydrating very well. You know, we all are going to get the virus sometime, you know, now or another variant in the future. The idea is that who's going to be a long hauler or who's going to actually have to go to the hospital, that depends on how much inflammation is already stacking. So we definitely want to try to stack, uh, reduce the stacking effects of inflammation. Again, eating a whole food plant-based diet, try to eat as much organic as possible, particularly if you're eating any of the top 12 most sprayed foods, that's where you get your biggest bang for your buck of you know, eating organic, avoiding animal proteins and saturated fats, avoiding uh, added sugars and salt. Again, many other lectures I've given on that. Test for your food sensitivities, both IgE and IgGs. Look for other things like microbiome, like that's what we look at, like SIBO or microbiome testing or nutritional and toxin levels. Like we look at everything, by, by the way, because it's not just one thing. Remember, it's the stacking effect of just multiple dysfunctions. Try to clean up your environment, try to eat more green, try to eat more clean, try to use more clean products on your body and in your home, reduce your stress, do some more yoga, do more meditation and exercise, strengthen your immune system. I have, I'll give other lectures on things that you can do like glucan 300 that we offer that's been clinically shown stronger than any other mushroom extract or any other glucan market product. And then obviously taking bosomeric SR for your inflammatory response. Even if you only take bosomeric just to replace your ibuprofen, Motrin, or Advil in your home, you're going to go a lot farther, a lot better with reducing your risk of side effects. So I want to thank everybody for, for uh, listening. Uh, here's my phone number here. You can call for an appointment. We do integrative medicine health coaching consultations. We also have, uh, we do nutrition consultations, Ayurvedic consultations with my partner, uh, Maureen Sutton. And uh, you can go to bossmeric.com, learn more about that, or sanjevnystore.com. Also, if you go to our website, you can sign up for our newsletters. We will be launching our podcast, which we'll be doing weekly programs covering daily activities and news of researching all the research uh, and published data, uh, both on drugs and supplements and kind of taking it to the mark and saying, breaking it down, is it real or it's not? So I appreciate all of you uh, taking the time today and listening, and I'll be open for some questions. Thank you. As always, Dr. Pai, that was thorough and wonderful and so helpful for so many of us. We really appreciate it. Um, yes, we have a few minutes for questions. We're going to get to as many as, many as we possibly can. And uh, I see that some hands are raised. Want to make sure everybody knows that if you want to raise your hand, you click on your reactions tab at the bottom of your screen and we'll see your hand come in. We'll take them in the order in which we uh, receive them. And I'm going to start now with the someone with the initials VB. Go right ahead, VB. Hello, Dr. Pai. Thank you for taking my question. Um, my question is for somebody that's trying to lower the ATP of the antibody thyroid peroxidase. Recently, when uh, I've done my labs, everything came normal. All the panels, chemistry, metabolic, everything, and uh, including the um, TSH, T43. However, um, the ATPO came back to 6,000, where the range is 0 to 50. I'm not sure what the implications. I'm a plant-based diet. Um, I had some gluten and dairy here and there, but um, trying to avoid them as much as possible. For 10 years, I had my ATPO around uh, 50 to uh, 250. Okay. And then going through some stressful times, it just raised, but never to 6,000. The most of it was 1,000. And now for like no reason, 6, All of a sudden, it was 6,000. So, so what we look at, thanks for your question. I think uh, you spoke yesterday. You tried to ask that question yesterday. and I, didn't I get tried then. I didn't yeah, get sorry to. Sorry about that. <laughs> yes, uh, thank the, you. the other people, there's too many people on the panel, so we, I didn't get to answer that question. Um, so I appreciate you coming back on today. I, 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 I like that, that tenacity of asking the question. Um, so that just means an itis, uh, the, the thyroiditis, right? The TP antibodies is like the Hashimoto's thyroiditis, thyroiditis is inflammation for something. So we have to still look at like, you know, is there something in the plant-based diet that's still triggering an inflammatory response? Stress can actually just do it by itself. Viruses can actually do it by itself. So we even saw, you know, during the pandemic, people that had COVID, again, just asymptomatic and not terrible, boom, TPO antibodies went off. Just like when people get a bad flu or bad cold, same thing, TPO can go off. So it can be something as simple as a virus, something as simple as stress. But more importantly, we have to look at also, you know, because remember, there's a stacking effect. You say, yeah, I was stressed. So it kind of went up to from 50 to 100 or 1,000. But then there's something else. Now, again, um, we also will look at the microbiome because if there's something wrong with the microbiome, you might be having something that you've been eating all the time, not having that much of a sensitivity. 
And all of a sudden it starts to flare because the absorption, the assimilation, the excretion of that food now can be now becoming a food sensitivity, which it wasn't bothering you before. If you look back at the microbiome lecture, that'll explain a little bit of what we're talking about there. But that's what we would do. We would do the evaluation of looking at those, trying to find out what is that inflammatory trigger that causes the itis of the thyroid. Taking, I'll give you an example, taking bosmeric, like if you were to take bosmeric, you know, two twice a day, for example, make sure your vitamin D is around 70. Take, you know, take it every day with your fat because it's a fat soluble vitamin and then just retest it like in a month. And if you start seeing it drop, then you already know that's just some kind of inflammatory response coming in the body. And then what you got to do is then they say like, okay, let me make an appointment with you, Dr. Pye or someone. And let's like, let's, let's investigate what are those specific triggers coming in. Thanks, Dr. Pye. That's great. And we're going to move now to Kaylee. Hi, Kaylee. Welcome. Uh, hi. Uh, actually, I'm Kaylee's husband, and uh, so I wanted to uh, ask a question. Um, I've been a, uh, a vegan without any salt, oil, or sugar for five years. Um, I also want to add that Kaylee has a group on Tuesday nights that reads a chapter from your book every week. Oh, wow. Um, <laughs> so, uh, there, and there were a number of people in that group. Uh, so my problem is I have rhinitis. And we live yeah. in uh, in New York where it's cold. It's only, I only have uh, drops coming out of my nose in the winter time. And the Kaylee doesn't feel it adds anything to the salad or soup when it drops into the salad or soup. Uh, and so is there something I can do uh, about rhinitis? So, yeah. So usually, you know, believe it or not, a lot of people have rhinitis. Now, if it's due to the temperature, sometimes the temperature change. Uh, that can cause rhinitis. That's a kind of like a vasodilation kind of issue and then causes the runny nose. Some people though, more often than not, if they have rhinitis almost throughout the year, say even if it's winter or even anything and they're like, gosh, I'm still getting, it's not spring or summer and I'm still getting, you know, runny nose, then that's usually a food trigger. That's why we test for the food sensitivity, even if you're plant-based, right? Even if you're organic, blah, 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 because it still could be anything in the plant world that's still triggering that kind of response. There is natural things. We do have things that will help with the rhinitis that if people are like, I don't want to do testing, but I just want to take it because I just, that's what it is. Um, then uh, uh, we have something called Histoplus in our office. And those are the natural antihistamine ingredients, the flavonoids that actually will help. So instead of taking a Zyrtec or a Claritin or Allegra, those kind of things that can have a little bit of side effects, you know, a lot of people want to be, you know, get dry mouth and stuff like that. Then the, the Histoplus works just as well and has other health benefits. Um, but we always like to look at the, uh, at the food first, because usually that's something that's like really underneath your nose, it's actually on your plate and that's, what's causing it. And you will never know until you test. Thanks. Thank Dr. you for reading the book, by the way. Yeah, thank you for that as well, Dr. Pai. And up next, we have Margie. I'm going to ask you to unmute. Let's see if that works. Hi, Margie. Yes, uh, thank you very much. You're excellent. Um, what do you think um, as far as uh, I'm in my smoothie every day, I buy organic uh, ginger root from Costco, and I also put in the organic turmeric from Costco. So it's the large... It, it's the real plant. The real plant. That's great. I mean, I love that. I mean, we should be. So like when we give it in the boss what we're trying to do is we're actually trying to reverse disease, right? But we're trying to get ahead. Like someone has a chronic inflammatory response. So I'm trying to get a pharmacological effect, but taking daily turmeric, you know, just taking about a fourth of a teaspoon or, or, or half a teaspoon a day or a little nub, you know, chop it in, putting it in thing. Fantastic. Remember there's other hundreds of compounds that are in uh, turmeric by itself, just a turmeric root that have wonderful benefits. And one of the things that we've done in our studies is that even though we put the 95% curcuminoids in there, we've actually calculated what's the minimum amount of just the regular part of the plant that is needed in the study to lower tuna, uh, NF kappa beta and tumor necrosis factor and inflammation. So the idea is that please eat it every day. I mean, you're going to get fiber, you're going to get, you know, a little protein, you get antioxidants is, you know, do that. We're just putting it in the pill. And the reason why is that when people actually have a headache, or they actually have a chronic inflammatory aspect, then what can they do instead of taking an ibuprofen or Motrin, something that has a, uh, a black box warning, let's give them something that's safe and more effective. But definitely I recommend people eating those foods on a daily basis. Thanks, Dr. Pai. And up next we have David A. Hi, David. Hi, how you doing? Um, I had two questions real quick. Um, you sounded like from yesterday's panel that you had concerns about coffee enemas and colon hydrotherapy. I was wondering if you could please elaborate what those concerns might be. Uh, I disrupt the microbiome. So if you go back to my lecture and you know, here on the microbiome, you know, what happens is flushing the microbiome out. You know, first of all, physiologically, you know, nobody 
generically or, or traditionally we look at worldwide does enemas as a way of evacuation as a, as a, as a normal routine practice of healing, you know, just because it was in the sixties and just because Gershon and all these other things, these myths propagate on the internet, but we, well, that's just that they didn't understand microbiome is evacuation. When someone's eating a standard American diet and they're constipated chronically helpful in the beginning. Absolutely. They haven't pooped for days. Definitely get them to go. They'll feel much better, but you're not a Jiffy Lube car to go in and get, you know, flushed out. What we're looking at is every time they're doing the flush out, you're actually losing your microbiome. Remember, there's over about four pounds of over a thousand species of a, a hundred trillion amounts of probiotics in your gut. When they use the, the, the 10 to 16 gallons of water that they're flushing out, that actually actually sucks out and pulls out. It's not just toxins. You're, mo- you're losing your microbiome and you can't just take a little probiotic that has 10 or 25 billion to replace a hundred trillion of a thousand species when you can only get maybe 10 to 30, 40, 50 different species maximally, uh, it starts to pass your stomach acid and all these other things. So to actually get some kind of clinical benefits, we do provide probiotics that can do that, but we can't replace everything. And so the colonics is like a short-term gain of a long-term problem. What we have to do is have people actually eat better, eat more fiber, eat more plant-based, you know, get the microbiome fixed. Then they don't need to have colonics or even coffee enemas. You know, coffee was really designed to be drinking from the mouth. You know, I just saw a shirt the other day. The best part of waking up is coffee in your butt. I don't necessarily agree with that idea. I kind of like doing it the old fashioned way, but I'm an old fashioned guy. So just letting you know the polyphenols, the antioxidants, a little bit of the caffeine, all those other aspects, you know, it's been shown, you know, most people be drinking coffee orally. And so these are just kind of trendy things that we see that, you know, kind of have a short term benefit. Sure. Is it absolutely needed for that person to get benefit to, to, to get better? No, it's not. Because when we follow clinics, now, I've been down in clinics in Mexico and all, and people are doing coffee enemas all the time and doing all these things. We don't see the data coming out showing any kind of clinic. They still do it because people want it. People will sell it. People will pay for it. But just because it's offered doesn't mean it's healthy. Just because, you know, Golden Arches says billions of burgers doesn't mean that's healthy nutrition. And so we have to be careful what people are listening to and what people are thinking and saying like, well, if you understand the microbiome, because we have people that when we test their microbiome before, and then they go to these places and test them after, it's gone. They've wiped out so many species. It all becomes pro-inflammatory. They have leaky gut. They have now dysbiosis. All this has occurred just from colon hydrotherapy or a coffee animal. Um, thanks very much for that, Dr. Pai. And in fact, um, thanks so much for everything that you did here. We are uh, moving on now, it's it's time to get into our next lecture. And so I just want to apologize. I'm sure I'm sorry we can't get to every single question, but we appreciate everybody raising their hand and stay tuned for the next time around. Dr. Pai, phenomenal as always. Really, really appreciate. Thank you, everyone. And again, please uh, go to our website, sanjevany.net, sign up for our thing. Look at Boss America. Sign up for our newsletter because if you want to find some evidence-based information going forward, definitely would like to listen on a podcast. We have interviewed many of the patients, the the doctors on these panels. So if you want to have like an in-depth interview from my perspective with them, kind of going on back and forth, uh, definitely sign up and that'll be coming soon. So I appreciate everybody taking the time. And anytime you want to do a consult, I'll be glad to help you to get to optimum health. And thank you very much. That is that is so excellent. Thank you very much. In fact, we're going to unmute everybody. I think everybody would like to say thank you as well. What do you say, everybody? Now, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.